been in America by what I can hear, but never mind about that. <laughs> Anne-Marie, you're most welcome and thank you for giving us your time and uh, experience tonight and the work you've put into this. I don't know how we can welcome you on screen with an applause, but you are most welcome. <laughs> There's absolutely no need for applause. Um, can I just say, uh, John, if it wasn't for John Battle, my theology books would still be sealed up in 16 boxes of books that were in my old office. But it's a pleasure to see all of you because it feels a bit, little bit like a reunion uh, of old friends and people who have worked with me and who I know. So thank you very much for your interest. I'm glad that John has introduced this as a type of reflection because it is not meant to be the definitive answer to how we should lead or how we should understand faith leadership. But it is my attempt to at least engage us in a discussion about how we could present this question to younger members of the church and to ask ourselves, how is faith meant to be squared up with leadership, particularly if in leadership tough decisions have to be made, or for example, you're in a corporate world, and there are some uh, colleagues who I work with now in the private sector on this call tonight. So the fact that we've enabled discussion, we want to encourage everybody to just be open and uh, to share experiences so that we can learn together. So thank you, John. Um, hopefully we won't be fostering more divisions about doers and players, uh, but that we will be trying to unite things and move things forward positively. So I'm just going to share my screen uh, and hope that this works. This is like your moment of truth. Uh, so here we go. So slide share from the beginning. There we go. So as John said, uh, this is entitled Faith, Spirituality and Leadership. And I've just put a picture there and you'll see there's some pictures that I think are deeply spiritual of leads that will be interspersed all throughout my presentation. And the picture on the right hand side is a sunset on Christmas Day taken in Ilkley. So some of you will recognise that road. And I suppose what I'm hoping for is that we can walk together down towards the light of what leadership and spirituality and faith might actually look like. Um, and it is a, a consistent path towards a fuller understanding. So just to move on, um, the aims of tonight, John has put it rather nicely, uh, but how I, I have decided to approach this is to be a little bit more personal than I would normally be, maybe because in my old age, I'm getting a bit more courageous about talking about myself, but I feel I might have some maybe experiences to share with you about what I think my leadership journey has taught me and the persons that I've met along the way who have shaped that understanding. And secondly then, to identify some key themes in relation to faith and leadership based on both my experience and also having studied theology. And finally then, for us together to generate some positive discussion about our values as leaders what we think the values are that should underpin good leadership, and then to look at that through the lens of spirituality and faith and leading others. So here we go. My journey of leadership actually began in the Diocese of Kildare and Lachlan in Ireland when I was 15. And I was chosen in my school, which was a, a convent school run by the Sisters of Mercy, to become what we called a Mehel leader. And this was about, there's my certificate, and you'll now be able to deduce my age, but anyway, so be it. And mehel in Irish means thrashing, which is about, as you know, the coming together of a community to harvest uh, crops and corn and things like that. So that's where the name was derived from. And it involved 10 girls from the school being selected through an interview process to go and live residentially together for a week as part of a youth leadership training course that was supported by the bishops in the diocese and rolled out in the local schools. So the key listening uh, attribute or the key uh, learning points that were promoted on this program and still are today. So this isn't an outdated program. This still runs and the gentleman who signed the bottom of the certificate is still in that job. And the key thing came up was listening, listening to others, 
And it's interesting that this theme of listening is a part of what we're trying to do in the church at the moment, is that leadership involves listening. So sometimes it's not listening to respond, it's listening in order to understand. And even in the early days of leadership, this key point was on this little programme in, you know, a small place in Ireland. And we lived together and we cooked our own meals and shared it with others. And I actually think there was a learning in terms of what teamwork was about from this simple fact of being together for doing everything, queuing up for the showers, trying to get to sleep together at night, people, you know, laughing and joking and others not. It required us to try to understand personalities. But one of the key things, and this was inspired by Paula Freire's theology, if we go back through to it, even though that wasn't to the foreground of the delivery when we were 15, uh, it was about understanding that each person is unique. And so for the people on this call, we are reminded that this idea of the dignity of the human person underpins most of the Catholic teachings on that are to do with leadership or to do with any aspect of the moral tradition. And equally, and although this wasn't mentioned, I went on years later to understand this at university, that we are imago dei and perfectly in the image of God. And it doesn't mean that we are perfect, but that we are his image. And so we begin from a position of positivity about who we are, rather than what we might instinctively think, which is I'm not good enough. I'm this, I have done that, I am, etc. So it's not to overlook either the reality of sin, but actually to acknowledge that where we begin in terms of leadership and who we are is from a more positive aspect, that your goals, that's how it was presented to us on the course, and that each person is unique and special. So other roles that I've had then it, afterwards, years later, I worked at Leeds Trinity where I met most of you. I was a programme leader, I led dissertations, I was an academic group leader for the humanities, English and history, politics. And then in the subsequent years, I led the postgraduate certificate in teaching and learning. I was leading on advanced HE fellowships and I was working with Leeds Citizens, uh, which I co-chair now with uh, Sir John Battle, who's on this call chairing this meeting. My current role is at Global Banking School and welcome to the colleagues from there who've come to support. And I'm an Associate Dean for Teaching Enhancement, which is more senior leadership. And that's not to show you my CV, it's to just show you the journey uh, towards leadership. Two weeks ago, I was in Manchester on Dr. Dinesh's campus, who, and he's here on the call, on a leadership excellence course. And this is a, an executive corporate course and if you look at just some of the themes on the word cloud, you'll see positive, caring, understanding, patient, trustworthy, helpful, determined, takes risk, courage, proactive, visionary. We have our own Pope saying all of these things. And so to my utter surprise, uh, one of the things maybe that was different was about entrepreneurship and the need to meet KPIs all of the time. But nevertheless, in terms of the values that are being promoted, there is absolute crossover. And therefore, it gives me hope that leadership and the principles that underpin responsible leadership are shared. So if we were to link all of this then to theology and how we ground it back into our, our thinking in a more um, specifically faith-based context, uh, before I left Leeds Trinity, John Battle gave me a book and I'm so grateful. I didn't want to read any more books at the time, but John said, read this book. And it was Timothy Radcliffe's book, Alive in God. And one of the phrases that stood out for me was, the gaze of Jesus is challenging, not because every sin is noted down, but because actually you're God's image, you're precious. Uh, it's a, a gaze of absolute delight in who you are. So again, it's not to overlook the reality of what we might get wrong, but it's to show that our theology has clearly moved on, even though some might say it has not. And there are difficulties understanding what the Vatican Council was trying to do, for example, but that a lot of these great theologians have moved on this thinking to a more positive understanding of the potential of the human person. And that's where we begin. We are alive in God. And again, from Radcliffe, 
uh, if you want to read the book, it's on page 128. Whether we like ourselves or not, the gaze of Jesus is always one of love. So it's hard to, to remember, isn't it? And you might think, oh, gosh, I can't be going on like that because I would be considered cocky or overconfident, etc. But deep within our theological tradition is this teaching that the gaze of love is upon you. So, you know, let, let that gaze be on you and begin from a position of potential and positivity. And that can be done with humbleness uh, as well. So we don't begin, and, and yes, yeah, some of you on the call might be likely to say, but Anne-Marie, there's still this idea that we're still in the pre-Vatican II mode and of enlisting sins, and particularly in the history of moral theology, as you all know, it was about very much listing sins, what we had done wrong, called legalism, and there's a place for rules and principles. But equally, a lot of this has moved on. Uh, so we, we, we are prompted to begin from a place of much more positivity. So we know as well, not just from leadership courses and experiences, and there's a lot of experienced people on this call, including people who've been in parliament and so on, relationships are key. And this is at the heart of what our spirituality and faith is about. It's, a, it's based on a primary relationship. And so when we look to particularly Catholic social teaching, and there are some of my former students on the call who I think now could probably do this better than me, which is what teaching and leadership is all about. So Rhiannon and Jack and all of those, I'm depending on you to take this dialogue forward. As I said, even when I reflect back on when I was 15, this concept of the dignity of the human person is present from the outset and it's present from the very heart of our Catholic social teaching and, and beyond, even before. Respect for everyone, irrespective of race, religion and culture, this idea that dignity is just given to you as a, as a mere fact that you are a person. And you might think, well, what's this got to do with leadership? good leadership, if we're to be honest, certainly in my own experience, the leaders that I respected the most were the ones that treated me with respect. And it's not that they overdid it and told me I was wonderful all the time, but even if they had something critical to say, the way in which they did that was extremely supportive and constructive. Then other themes that we look across the Catholic social tradition, themes like the common good. So the leader, is leading for the good of everyone. And if you look at the definitions in the teachings on what the common good is, and yes, it's not without its issues. How do you establish common good when everybody has maybe their own specific aspect of that that they want to realize? But in the overall, we live in communion, we live in teams of people, communities of practice, communities of practitioners, of lawyers, doctors, ed academics, uh, any, uh, in any walk of life. And so you have to think of the common good often. So this is all about the fulfillment of people. If you look into the documents, either as individuals or as groups to reach more fulfilling living. Solidarity with each other. And we see again and again, don't we? Even if we look at it from the point of view of trade unions and John and I both know a very senior person who represents trade unions. Uh, all of the time. And, and we find that part of what his job is, is actually to stand in solidarity with those who need representation. And people appreciate even this fact, even if they lose their case, he tells me standing in solidarity with these individuals means so much more. And the leader has to do this as well, even if, uh, you know, you may not want to. And as John said, it's controversial. There is a thing about solidarity and there is a thing I'll get to in a minute about having the conscience to know when solidarity needs to be questioned. And it's not just absolute loyalty to a person because they're your friend or they're your professional colleague for 20 years. The key, another key one that is probably we talk about less in Catholic social thought is this idea of participation. And John reminds us again and again of this. Uh, that we have to enable in the Catholic tradition, this is part of our of our teachings, that we enable others to be able to participate. And that is to provide the conditions for people to participate fully in whatever might be going on. So again, in listening, what are you doing? The leader is trying to enable others to participate fully in whatever might be required. 
And then finally, there are other aspects to Catholic social teaching, like the universal destination of goods, etc., which we could go into more deeply if it was an academic paper. But again, just the key themes, even to my mind, resonate with what we can pass on to young people in order to tell them we have this body of teaching that can help with leadership. And uh, in more recent times, Pope Francis has spoken of this cult of celebrity. So do we want to be leaders because we want to be famous and we want to be acknowledged as having a title, etc.? It may well be OK to be well known, but what are you doing with that power? So uh, John is talking about the idea in the introduction there of power and being a leader in the church. What does that mean? So is it about the cult of celebrity? Or is it about service? And is it about including others? So you may well be a type of celebrity, but what do you do with that? What do you do with secrecy? If it's secrecy for the sake of establishing more power under your leadership, that's unhealthy. But there may be other times where one has to be respecting confidentiality. So all of these themes are within the tradition. So I just want to talk a little bit for a few minutes about developments in relation to the past. So I mentioned briefly at the start that if we look at the history of the development, particularly of moral theology, we see that uh, Evangelii Gaudium is moving things on from what we might have known pre-Vatican II. So with this term of appearances notwithstanding, everyone is holy, everyone deserves love, this has really moved on from times where we were beginning with the, the training of priests for the confessional was the remit of the discipline of moral theology. And Vincent McNamara, who is quite a um, senior person now in terms of age, uh, wrote in 2010, he was actually my external examiner from a doctorate. He says in his book on becoming human, the whole of the moral enterprise is now seen as being about the well-being of ourselves and others. So again, in that theme of we begin from a place of much more positivity than we did before is something that we have Vatican II to thank for. And I'm not trying to overshadow or say that all the problems are resolved. They're not, but thematically the potential for this perspective is absolutely rooted in there. So in the blog that John and uh, Joe asked me to write for Justice and Peace, I talk about God's leadership legends. And let me explain this term. When I was a lecturer at Leeds Trinity, lots of my students used to say, so-and-so is a legend, Amory. Oh, my friend, Jack is a legend. And I used to think, wow, they have such admiration for each other. So this was just absolute, you know, categorical admiration for what a certain person in the class had done. And so then I thought, well, who are the legends in leadership? So this is a person there beside me. I'm about 26 years of age in that photograph. And this is Kevin Kelly, who you all know. And Kevin, in my opinion, if I was to choose a leadership legend in the Catholic moral tradition, he was one of those. And so one of the things I'd like us to reflect on tonight is in a more kind of using the language of what I know young people to be, young students, and I don't mean young in a patronising sense, because I see you as the future. Let's ask ourselves, what makes someone a legend? Someone with a faith and someone who has understood these principles and their behaviour reflects that. Why are they worthy of admiration? So my other leadership legend, I'm going to put dot, dot, dot for a minute, is a friend, a mentor, a leader not only in my eyes, but has been a leader nationally in this country, is inspirational. And also this person, I spent COVID lockdown by myself, I live alone, and that was very difficult. And this individual came and sat with me over a cup of tea and a computer, and we spoke about careers and career choices. And that person is John Battle, who is now Sir John, for anyone who doesn't know, and his wife, Lady Mary Battle have always guided, and they might not even admit to this, but anything advice wise that they've ever said to me has always been sincere, and I know that. And I've put a copy of just the front color cover of a book I edited on social justice, which John has a chapter in which discusses the journey of lead citizens from the start to where it was two years ago in this book. And I just want to say, John, that it's a privilege to have a sir 
who's written in a book that I've edited. And to just to say to people on the call, especially those who are younger, you never know who you are going to meet along your journey in leadership and along your journey in your career, because they are also on a career. I can hardly believe I know Sir John Battle as a friend, but I do. And here is something that John actually wrote from the point of view of politics and liberation theology and leadership himself in 2007, which I looked up today. So he says, and I'm going to read it out because I think it's worthy of reflection. Starting from a focus on the crucified people locally and globally, identifying the poor and oppressed in our own decaying inner city neighborhoods, as well as on the scrub plains of sub-Saharan Africa, it's crucial to get beyond the present debilitating culture of a pessimistic fear to a belief in the possibilities of politics as a means of change. And I find this really powerful. So John would have written that in his position of leadership, having been in the parliament, et cetera, and now a sir. And I'm sorry if I'm embarrassing you, John, but this is sincere. That he, said, he goes on to say in that article, let's take people down from the cross in every way that we can. And so when we refer this back to leadership at the very heart of not only our liberation theology, but we have leaders in our own local community in the diocese asking us to do that. And leadership isn't just thinking about what's happening in other countries internationally, it's what's happening all around. What, what, what lens are you looking at your own community through? And that's leadership. Now, Rhiannon is also on the call. So I've entitled this slide, and I have permission to show a photograph. This is Rhiannon and I at Youth 2000, which Rhiannon was leading, and she invited me to because I was, I think I was academic group leader for theology. So I've put there, passing on what we know. So I've said my influences were John and Kevin, and there are others, but they're huge giants of this discipline. But what I've learned from them is to pass on enable others. Don't try to ask them to become what you are. Don't ask for followers, ask for leaders. See, as Timothy Radcliffe says, their potential. And in the Bible, it tells us to cultivate thine own gift in the book of Timothy, chapter four. Fratelli Tutti, if we follow it through, says in paragraph four, only the person who approaches others not to draw them into their own life but to help them become ever more fully themselves can truly be called a, a father. And I think if we can link that to leadership, it's all about empowering a person to become the best version of themselves that they can be. And yes, flawed, it doesn't mean they're perfect. We're on a journey, but they don't become exactly the image of their own mentor. So just to look a bit more deeply into paragraph eight then of Fratelli Tutti, again, it begins about this human dignity, we acknowledge the dignity of the person and we can contribute to a rebirth of a universal aspiration to fraternity between everyone. And I'm going to read the rest of this because I think it's beautiful. Here we have a splendid secret. This is our Pope saying that it shows us how to dream and to turn our life into a wonderful adventure. No one can face life in isolation. So the leader does not lead alone. We do it together and we dream together. We need then a community that supports and helps us with this, which my friends are on this call. I couldn't believe I've seen all of you, in which we can help one another to keep looking ahead. How important it is to dream together by ourselves. We just risk seeing a mirage, things that are not there. Dreams are built. So again, we can take inspiration from these most recent teachings about daring to dream dare to dream the world differently, dare to dream leadership differently, and dare to actually draw on your faith tradition to do that. So this is a term that I have learned since I went to GBS, which is a private sector higher education provider. We have a campus in Leeds, and we have lots of campuses in the key cities around the UK and now in Dubai and Malta. But this term was a new term for me until I worked at Global Banking, which is called strategic unity. And I just want to share it with you. Uh, because strategic unity refers to, we can have a top level strategy uh, uh, initiated by senior management, uh, but what strategic unity is about is that that strategy will become nothing 
if someone has dreamt it up and they're not able to implement it and get others to dream together. So linking back to Fratelli Tutti, strategies are dreams, but they're only dreams until the people who share that decide to make them a reality. So in leadership, you don't lead by yourself ever. You don't even dream by yourself ever. You empower teams to come around the vision you might have or the vision they might have and enable them to put that in place. All bearing in mind this, these principles of having respect for each other and gratitude and appreciation, that even if someone in your business is brighter than you, that's fine. That should be fine. And that can be a tough pill to swallow. This is a letterbox <laughs> that's at the end of my street in Horsford. And somebody has knitted a top for it with the Leeds United uh, colours. Now, the reason I took a photograph is because some of you know John Wilson from the used to be based in the Diocese of Leeds, Bishop John, and he gave a sermon in the cathedral one night where he said there was a letterbox in Leeds that was decommissioned or whatever the correct term is, and it was out of use. But the people in the community still thought it was in use and they put the letters and posted them in until one day someone said, we should open this, it's totally full. And what he said in the sermon was, this is like God. He is sending letters to people and are not delivered. So ask yourself as part of the reflection tonight, is a letter about who you are and what your gift is being sent to you from somebody or somebody who's an instrument of God or is God asking you? So we're going to do that in the breakout rooms to be something. What is your gift? What is the letter that would be wrote to you? So that, I'll just leave you with that thought. And if you want to visit the letterbox, I can give you the address. So the key question then, and this is what I put in the blog that Joe and John asked me to write, who do we want to be as leaders? What values do we want to underpin given the richness of the tradition? And even if you look across other tr religious traditions, you'll find similar things. And as I said, in the corporate leadership uh, course that I was on at GBS, similar values were there. So what values do we want to underpin what we do? Do we care about values at all? Do we just care about KPIs and uh, the outcomes? And this is where for people of faith, the spiritual needs the moral. So John said, we tend to create a dichotomy between those who act for social justice and those who pray. But actually, if we pray, that should ideally for anybody who has studied the moral tradition, play out in our behavior subsequently. We are called to love the things God loves, loves, and that's creation in all its forms, everybody and the creation itself. So we don't want spirituality to just become a personalized search for, for fulfillment, but that it, play out, it plays out in our lives. So if the definition of spirituality, while difficult to pin down, generically speaking, you can say that, that we do acknowledge as people of faith that there's a deeper dimension at play in our lives that we are called to pray and worship together. Different ways of doing it, I've just put an example, could be Lexio Divina reading the Bible, it could be that you reflect in nature, you pray outside as well as at church. Practices enable us to move towards more authenticity in our lives, but that should also be reflected, not just in the private sphere, but in how we interact and how we do our jobs, etc. So when we do this, and again, if you look up people like Vincent McNamara and others that have written on spirituality, they say we reflect God's love when we do that. To go deeper into life we is the spiritual, but we come back from that relationship reflecting what is required. So I've put a photograph, and believe it or not, this is taken in Horsford, in the woods up from the road for me, again in lockdown where I could not believe that the perfect image of the trees was reflected in the water. And I just thought, let me use it in the presentation to try to prompt some discussion about, are we reflecting what our relationship with God is in everything that we do? So another key theme is just about learning from the past. And I have a book here beside me, which I've cited in the article. I would encourage anybody who's interested in women healing the earth, to read it. It's edited by Rosemary Radford Ruther. And in this book, there's a chapter by Mary Judith Rees. And they talk about how women, after five centuries of, of, of women and being empowered to do things in that community, they decide to engage in this exercise where they go back and they walk in their grandmother's feet. They reflect back on 
What would our grandmother have done? What would our grandmothers have decided in this situation? And they have a women's network in Latin America where they walk back through history to reflect on the lessons learned. So I would encourage anybody who's interested in leadership as a young person, not to see yourself as a bubble with other young people only, even though you do learn from your peers, but to learn from the giants that are even on this call because they have experienced leadership. Talk to people, seek advice, and most importantly, go to the secret core and sanctuary as Vatican II calls conscience, where you're alone with God and ask yourself, yes, there are questions and we know this theologically, is it about discernment or is it about obedience to magisterial teaching authorities? And we know the moral theologians have engaged with this question now for decades, but nevertheless, this remains at the heart of our teachings and the secret core and sanctuary is a part of what we need to be reflecting on in our decision-making. So the spirituality is all around, in my opinion. This is Rob Burrow, who you all know of, Leeds Rhinos. He, this is outside of Leeds Met in town at the moment. Accept challenge. Let's not think that just also, uh, John mentioned Jesus. Jesus had a lot of challenge. He had to actually challenge others and be challenged and questioned all of the time. Leadership will involve this. In a world full of adversity, Rob Burrow says, we must dare to dream. So there we are, look, dreaming again. Dream, vision the world differently. And because you're people of faith, this is me lighting a candle. Uh, that's from the cathedral, actually. Plant seeds of hope. So my advice, and I'm only a part way through my leadership journey. Who knows where it will go next? I got a bouquet of flowers from uh, Notre Dame Sixth Form when I was moving jobs and they said, go where God plants you. And I loved that. Jack, this is from your bosses. Get a mentor, get involved in action learning sets, which are like groups of people from any sector to discuss things you are working on. Get a coach. One of the things we're trying to do at GBS with Dr. Dinesh, if he wants to share this, we're trying to get performance coaches to work alongside our staff so that we're coaching rather than traditional line managing, coaching people to be the best version of themselves and lead in the way that suits them and perform. And admit that a lack of skills is not always a fault, but that we're just making a commitment to want to learn more. Accept where we've gone wrong. And if you're a person of faith, I find this helps me. And I, I, I you know, as much as everybody else, some days I can't pray, I think I'm too upset, but I really try to make prayer a thing that I do all the time. And my final slide is this lady's picture is in Leeds uh, train station at the moment. <laughs> I don't know who she is. Mo I think the council must have put this up, but anyway, John could probably find out. She's there, look, fearless and feminine. And I'm not promoting any agenda by showing that other than to say, this lady looks like she knows herself to me. And she could lead things. And I think if she told me what to do, I would listen. But the leader of faith for me is to have the courage to recognize the goodness and beauty that is in yourself in a humble way and that God sees in you. But that is also recognizing the goodness and potential of others. And subsequently, as Fratelli Tutti says, because it ends in a prayer, as you all know, Pray for the ability to recognize goodness and beauty that is in others and forge bonds of unity, common projects and shared dreams. Amen. So I've explained to you why I'm using this concept of legend. Thank you to all the young people who taught me that. Be a legend. And surprisingly, maybe in a Justice and Peace Commission meeting, I'm going to bring this totally into the world of celebrity so we can discuss that as well. Judy Garland said, Always be a first-rate version of yourself instead of a second-rate version of somebody else. And I think we need, however difficult it is, remembering the gaze of the Lord on your life. That is a positive gaze. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you have potential and that that's where we begin. So this lady, whoever she is, I think is a legend. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and say thank you for listening. and. I hope that in some way help, will help to frame some discussions and prompt us to discuss some ideas together. Over to you, John. Okay, well, 
Anne-Marie, thanks for that, a richness of that uh, approach. And I think we've got enough to work on in little groups there. And I think